coming up on the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. Three to five days a week, three to five exercises. You're going to do three to five reps per set, three to five sets. Okay, and then you're going to rest three to five minutes in between each set. Now, you can actually get a little bit, you can get, you, you can typically get quite shorter on that rest. Um, right. But it, it emphasizes the point that with strength training, particularly when you want to truly get strong, you need to be fresh. And that's because the quality of each repetition needs to be high. So what that means is if you were to do five sets of five, that's within the spectrum, and you were to rest a minute in between each set, certainly by the third or fourth or absolutely by the fifth set, you, the fatigue would be building up. So you'd either have to do less sets, less reps, or less weight. And that is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do with strength. Remember when I started this conversation, the whole idea is that as close to possible as that one rep max. And if you're intentionally lowering that because you're lowering rest, well, now you're simply working on endurance. Fine too. That's a different goal, but that's not what you told me. You said the goal was strong. Right. So if we're hedging towards strong, we need to have a lot of rest. Hello, and welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. I'm Brian Grin, and I'm here to give you actionable tips to get your body back to what it once was 5, 10, even 15 years ago. Each week, I'll give you an in-depth interview with a health expert from around the world to cut through the fluff and get you long-term sustainable results. This week, I interview Dr. Andy Galpin. Dr. Galpin has his PhD in human bioenergetics and has been a professor at CSU Fullerton since 2011. He's also the director of the Center for Sports Performance since 2015, where he conducts research on anything that's relevant to human performance. We discussed many topics surrounding nutrition, strength training, along with his three by five training protocol, the difference between strength versus hypertrophy, tools to optimize recovery, effective supplements for building muscle, and his one tip to get your body back to what it once was. Really enjoyed my interview with Dr. Galpin. I know you will too. Thanks so much for listening and enjoy the show. All right. Welcome to the Get Lean, Eat Clean podcast. My name is Brian Grin, and I have Dr. Andy Galpin on. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me here, man. Yeah, for your intro, I was going to say you're a scientist, teacher, coach, author. Uh, am I missing anything? Podcast host, right? <laughs> uh, something like that, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm, I'm excited to have you on. Um, you're out in California, professor at, C at CSU. Is that correct? Uh, Cal State Fullerton. Yeah, there's like 26 CSUs. So you've got to kind of <laughs> distinguish which one there. Gotcha, gotcha. And um, maybe uh, just explain to the audience your background and and how you got into nutrition and strength training and and you know just everything about you know becoming a professor and everything. Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I mean, I grew up uh, in a small town in the Pacific Northwest. And so I, I sort of did everything athletically as um, baseball, football, basketball, all those things. And um, I had this, uh, what I call like perfect mix for my current job, which is that I was pretty good at sports, but not too good. And so that puts the emphasis squarely on making sure that you do things better. So whether that was you know, training harder or watching more tape or eating better, because if I didn't do those things, it was going to make a big impact. And if I did, it was also going to make a big impact. So early on, I always knew that sports was a major love. And if I could figure out a way to be in sports my whole life, that would be great. So initially kind of in high school, I thought maybe that's, you know, PE teacher or actual sport coach. Mm -hmm. That's sort of your only two avenues, you know, pre-internet and all that stuff. And then, uh, so I was fortunate enough to play college football uh, and got, um, in fact, it's funny because I remember going on recruiting trips they kind of ask your interest and I was just like, well, I want to do this human performance kind of thing. And it was just like, oh, okay. Like athletic training or pre-med. And I'm like, no, like I'm not taping ankles. <laughs> like right. I'm definitely not going to med school. And it just kinesiology exercise science didn't really exist. So um, I was fortunate there was an exercise science program where I was, but it was very little. I mean, it was no sport performance. It was obesity, public health, you know, but it, it was still physiology. Right. Okay, great. Uh, so from there, I went and worked at a place called Athletes Performance in uh, Arizona that trained we had several hundred professional athletes. Uh, and then I spent half a year or so down there and realized that I don't want to actually be like a strength and conditioning coach. Right. That was just a terrible experience. Um, so I went back and got my master's degree 
at the University of Memphis in human movement sciences, which is all kind of the same thing, you know, exercise science, kinesiology, it's same word, really. Yeah. I uh, started uh, competing in Olympic weightlifting and mm -hmm. um, combat sports and started coaching um, athletes because we opened up a gym. My, bu my buddy's bar Barbell Shrugged and opened up a gym. And so some of our first clients were fighters. Mm -hmm. So we started working with them and then started competing in those sports myself and was like, well, this is pretty cool. Went on and get a, got a PhD in human bioenergetics and then continued on the side to train and compete and work with those clients. Uh, then in 2011, I got my job here at Cal State Fullerton. So I came all the way, kind of circled the 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 content or the content, the country rather, <laughs> and got back down here to Southern California and then um, just you know started my labs, eventually took over the Center for Sport Performance down here, uh, continued to work with athletes and of course got higher and higher profile athletes. And then that's, that's what brought you to today. And, and I see you got a UFC shirt on. <clears throat> What did you learn from working with some of the guys, uh, the MMA guys? Uh, I know you've got a background yourself. Do you do jujitsu or? The... Yeah, well, what happened was I, uh, as a master's student, I was competing in Olympic weightlifting and uh, I was having a, a pretty good amount of success there. Uh, but I was just was sort of at the end of that road. Uh, I didn't want to continue competing there. I don't even know why. It was going very well. And um, I had about six weeks left before I was going to leave Memphis and go to start my PhD in central Indiana. And um, the jiu-jitsu guys and the fighters were just like, why don't you come over and just play around for six weeks? And and like anyone who's done jiu-jitsu will tell you, like the first two or three assessments, you're just like, wow, mm. this is incredible. <laughs> I can just fell in love there. So that was um, great. And then when I got to Indiana, like the only little town I was in, there's this sort of one gym really and uh and it was just like a full fight gym it's just like we just showed up fought but i was like this is still pretty cool <laughs> later on there was a, a full proper jiu-jitsu gym that opened up uh, so i spent a lot of time over in both places but i did that um and then yeah you know like i've had a, i've had a lot of experience i've been fortunate to work with a handful of a large handful of, of some of the best fighters in the world that, that we've ever seen from heavyweights to straw weights to middleweights lightweights i got um a guy fighting here in a couple of weeks. Um, you know, I had multiple world championships and and done all that stuff. So I, I, it's a ton of lessons. And, and I guess to kind of come back to your initial question was one of the reasons why I was interested in that sport, because I don't come from a, a martial arts background. I never thought like Kung Fu was cool or like I, I hated wrestling. I still think wrestling is the stupidest thing ever. <laughs> I just can't stand <laughs> any of those things. Uh, it was just more of like academically, this was very different. It was very, when I had gone back like six years prior and I was working with baseball players, major league baseball guys and NFL guys, it was just like, it wasn't intellectually difficult to figure out, okay, energy systems, okay, movement patterns, like all this stuff was very textbooky. So it just, not that it's easy to work with those folks, but it's like, it's not that challenging mentally. And when I got to the fighters, I was like, whoa, like what energy system do we work in? That's not going to work. Movement pattern, like all the, nothing was in the textbook. And I'm just like, holy cow. So I just got really excited to work with a population of folks who it was going to have to be different than whatever you're going to find on any textbook at all. So, no. or any clinic or anything like that. There was no internet, like really still. And so you couldn't just like buy a book on MMA training, or whatever. It's just like, you're going to have to figure these things out and use some science and some physiology and solve some problems. So um, yeah, that's, that's where I got into that stuff. And on, speaking of that, of like strength training, why don't we talk a little bit about, I know you have di different protocols depending on the individual, obviously, but you have sort of this three by five concept, um, for strength training, maybe explain a little bit about, um, how, you know, someone can sort of implement that into their lives. Yeah. So there's a whole bunch of adaptations you can get from exercise. And what I'll say it is this, if you're untrained, which means like you don't really exercise at all, it's sort of irrelevant what you do. You're going to get you're going to get stronger. You're going to get faster. You're going to gain more muscle. You're going to lose fat. You're going to get all these adaptations. Um, after that, though, once you're even moderately trained, then specificity starts to matter. And so, regarding strength, if you're truly trying to optimize strength, um, then specificity is what matters. And so, think about it like this: if you want to get better at shooting free throws, the most important thing you could ever do is shoot free throws. If you want to get better at being strong, the most important thing you could ever do is push or pull or drag or whatever it is, something that is just beyond what you can currently do. 
like that's it's specificity, right? You practice the exact act of overcoming the amount of force that you can no longer, yeah, you can't currently do. That's how you get stronger. So in theory, the most specific thing you could ever do to improve strength is to do nothing but one repetition maximums. So what's the maximum amount of, you can bench press? You go in there and you do one rep at that weight or slightly even higher. Hmm. Okay. So theoretically, that's the most direct path. Unfortunately, um, that that's a short game to play because you're not going to be able to do that very long. Um, injury risk starts to get up there and you're not actually, you haven't really actually addressed the potential limiter. So what I mean by that is you may be having technical issues. You may have the fact that if you train like that, you can only do it so many days in a row before you get hurt or, or anything else. So if we back off that a little bit and think, okay, what's really close to specific, but also is a long-term strategy, something I can continue to progressively overload. So that's a term we're going to hear in our field a lot. And it's very, very important. In fact, if I had to boil it down, all of exercise training, the single most important concept is probably progressive overload. You just have to continue to get better and better. Initially, you're going to think that just means, okay, I'll put a few extra pounds in the bar every time I work out, or I'll go one more mile on my run, or I'll do five more minutes on the bike or whatever. But you can't necessarily do that either because, again, run that math in your head. Like five more pounds this week, five more. Well, how many more weeks can you continue to do that before you're up 100 pounds? Like that's just not realistic. So what you have to do is progressively overload, but you have to do it in a fashion that's realistic and has a little bit of baked in um, what we call deloads or back off weeks or regressions or something like that. So to finally answer your question then, the three by five concept is a little bit of a combination of all of these things. It's not optimal for the highest trained individuals, though it would certainly work. It's not um, the only thing you could ever do or have to do, but it is a system where you can take it and work probably most people for many years and be just fine, as long as they're progressing within this concept, right? You still have to progress and you still have to back off at some point. So three to five is not mine. I did not develop it. It's been around for decades and decades. It was around when I was, in fact, the reason I, I, I posted about this a long time ago was I remember doing this in college. And just being like, just keep it, you know, explaining to people, just be like, all right, three by five, just do this. And like, oh, okay, uh, now I don't have to answer all your questions. Just go like, go do this, right? It's a very yeah, simple, simple way. Yeah. <laughs> so here's what this is. Three to five days per week. So if you're more trained or like training more, go to five. If it's the opposite, go to three. Like that's a, most people can train somewhere between three, five times a week. You're going to pick three to five exercises. So just out the gates, this could be five days a week of five exercises. It could also be as little as three days a week of three exercises. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very manageable system that takes you from like a lot of training to actually pretty little, all right? Or some combination in between. So three to five days a week, three to five exercises. You're going to do three to five reps per set, three to five sets, okay? And then you're gonna rest three to five minutes in between each set. Now, you can actually get a little bit, you can get, you, you can typically get quite shorter on that rest, um, right. but it, it emphasizes the point that with strength training, particularly when you want to truly get strong, you need to be fresh. And that's because the quality of each repetition needs to be high. So what that means is if you were to do five sets of five, that's within the spectrum, and you were to rest a minute in between each set, certainly by the third or fourth or absolutely by the fifth set. You, the fatigue would be building up. So you'd either have to do less sets, less reps, or less weight. And that is exactly the opposite of what we're trying to do with strength. Remember when I started this conversation, the whole idea is lift as close to possible as that one rep max. And if you're intentionally lowering that because you're lowering rest, well, now you're simply working on endurance. Fine too. That's a different goal, but that's not what you told me. You said the goal was strong. Right. So if we're hedging towards strong, we need to have a lot of rest. Um, in reality, if you're doing like three sets of three, you probably don't need five minutes of rest. Most people, right. That may be like a little excessive. Sure. So take every one of these numbers with just, a, it, it's just, how can I make this one word three by five? So like not everything here has to line up perfectly well. So three days a week or three to five days a week, three to five exercises, three to five sets, three to five reps, three to five minute rest. And then in terms of the load, you want to go as heavy as you possibly can. 
within those parameters. So if that's, you know, again, you're trying to get strong, so you got to push the amount of weight on the bar, and that's where we're going to go after. And I know there's, you know, there's some individuals out there preaching about like one set to failure. Uh, like, what's your thoughts around that and versus something like the three to five method? Well, it, it's all, it's all context. I mean, yeah. One set like, to failure, one total set to yeah, repetitions like, of failure. Like time under tension and yeah. Sure. I mean, and we've, we already, we've answered that question. I mean, quite clearly. In the yeah. literature, it goes against specificity. It goes against. There's just no little actual load there. I mean, is it waste? A total waste? No, not at all. In fact, you can go back and watch old Mike Metzer videos. Just, just type that guy in. Mm -hmm. um, a legendary bodybuilding coach. He had fantastic results with super slow stuff. You know, one set, one repetition. Sometimes twenty or thirty second set. Yeah. Rep. You know, same thing. You can get a lot of results there. It's just not going to maximize strength. Um, can you get stronger that way? For sure. And so the difference here you have to pay attention to is like, is it optimal versus does it work? When I when I say it's not optimal, it doesn't mean it doesn't work. And you might not care. You know, maybe it's a twenty percent difference. You might not be like, okay, well, fine, I don't care about twenty. Okay, great. Like then it totally works. And then what about endurance training? <laughs> Would that just be um, like obviously higher rep range and? Um, what, what protocol would you prescribe someone for, uh, building endurance? Depends on what kind of endurance. There are many, 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 many types of endurance. <laughs> yeah. Well, muscular endurance, you know, you got fast for slow, first, first, you know, slow twitch muscles. So, um, how would you go about that? Yeah. So muscular endurance is think about this as how many repetitions can a muscle, uh, execute, uh, independent, basically, of external fuel. What I mean by that is it's typically something in the like 8 to 50 rep range. When you start crossing past that rep range, you're now usually not going to get failed by the muscle, but you're going to get failed by systemic problems. So people tend to call this more of like cardiovascular or energetic or metabolic thing. I mean, really, fatigue comes down to a couple of things. Number one, is it excess buildup of waste? Number two, is it reduction of fuel? The overwhelming majority of time you're going to run into problems is not running out of fuel. It's always going to be fatigue management. So in the case of what you're talking about, like, you know, how many push-ups in a row can I do? It's not going to be, you're not going to run low on oxygen. You're not going to run out of uh, carbohydrate or muscle glycogen. It's simply going to be how much burn, how much metabolic waste can you handle before you quit? Like, that's all it comes down to. So the protocol, do whatever you want that makes the muscle tired. Right. That, that That's as simple as it is. And so whether that's a set of 15, great. Whether that's isometrics and you just hold it, whether it's super slow stuff like you talked, it doesn't really matter. All you're trying to do is put the muscle into fatigue. And then you want to progressively overload that. That's, that, I mean, that's as idiot proof as it gets, right? It's like you did 20 reps last time and the next week either increase the weight a little bit or keep the weight the same and do 22 reps. Like that's, and you held it for 15 seconds last time, hold it for 20 now. That's all you have to do for endurance. It's very difficult. Um, it's very easy in terms of if the muscle's getting tired, then you're working on endurance. Got it. And I mean, you could, is there some, is it black and white? Like you obviously, if you take someone who's untrained and they start lifting and doing 15 to 20 reps and fatiguing the muscle, they're going to. They're not. They're going to build endurance, but they're also going to build muscle strength as well. Is that? Would you agree? Yes, of course. Yeah, that's yeah. a really nice point, right? Now. There's a. Um, it's a huge overlap between all these things. So, mm -hmm. like, here, here's a good example. If you were to do sets of like six to nine reps, so six to nine reps per set, and you did, you know, four sets of that or something, you're going to build a little bit of strength. Even at sets of seven, eight, like there's overlap. It's a taper, right? So right. kind of starts coming down. You're going to build some hypertrophy because you're starting to taper into that range. You're going to actually start tapering a little bit in a muscular endurance. You can go into that range, right? So you're actually getting multiple things. So this is why generally people like to program things between like five to 10 reps per set for the general population because you're going to get multiple adaptations at once. And a little bit of strong, a little bit of muscle, a little bit of muscular endurance, 
bang, we're there. Well, how would you define the difference between strength and hypertrophy? Strength is force production. So how strong you are, how much can you move? Or in the science term is force, right? What's the max amount of force you can produce? Hypertrophy is simply a measure of muscle size. So hypertrophy is diameter of, of the muscle. How large is it? A hypertrophy has nothing to actually do whatsoever with functionality. Doesn't describe anything about how the muscle contracts, how much force it can produce, how fatigue resistant it is, how strong it is, anything like that. Now, obviously, those two things are intertwined. Generally, a right. bigger muscle is stronger, though it's not a perfect correlation. But generally, it's going to happen. And generally, if you get bigger, you're going to get stronger, at least a little bit. Um, generally, if you get stronger, you're going to get bigger, but not always. The, that second one is not as attached. So it's quite easy to get strong. Actually, it's, it's, it's easier to get strong without gaining muscle if you desire to. Hmm. It's very difficult to put on a lot of muscle and not get kind of strong. <laughs> not that anyone would ever sort of want that, but like, it's a very challenging thing to do. And what do you do with your workouts and how do you, um, you know, cause like for, I've been lifting for a while and like 20 years of traditional lifting. Uh, but over the last few years, I've actually implemented some resistance bands, uh, during like COVID I started doing some of the X3. I don't know if you're familiar with the X3. Um, okay. And, uh, either way started implementing resistance bands and it was actually felt it was easier on my joints, but I, I did feel like I was building building strength and hypertrophy, I would say. <laughs> um, I don't really do like one rep max anymore. I mean, do you say, oh, a, a person gets to maybe a certain age? I, I don't know if a certain age or if like, you know, is the risk uh, not worth it as far as like one rep mask, max and things like that. But what type of protocol would you say for someone that's maybe 40 plus getting into as opposed to someone who's 25? Yeah, uh, I actually don't draw that much distinction between the two. Okay. So I don't think that, and not the way that you think. Uh, in other words, like I don't think that necessarily the 25 year old should be doing what most 25 year olds are doing. Okay. It is the way I think about it, right? So uh, a couple of things in there. Number one is the risk of doing like a one rep max go up after 40. No, it doesn't actually. You're totally fine. Um, I would say that if you've ever watched a 25 year old in the gym do a one rep max, it, it's terrifying. <laughs> they generally shouldn't be doing it either because they don't know what the hell they're doing. True. And that's, that's like, that's what I mean when I say, I don't, I don't see a distinction actually. I think a lot of people that are doing one or maxes should not be doing them um, or, or getting even close. Um, so that, that's the first sort of thing about it. Uh, the protocols I don't think should differ. 40 is not old. 40. I'm not. Thank you. Yet, but... Thank you so much. How old are you? Are you 40? You... I'm in my thirties still. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I got some time. <laughs> um, but no, like it, it's not, it's not even close to old. Like right, to me, right. distinction, you, know, you start drawing 55 plus, like maybe, but prior to that, no. Right. Um, there's a bigger, there's a difference between just you personally, but your ages, 40, 41, those are not ages that I care about. Um, so the, yeah, I mean, the protocol should be specific to the individual's needs. And that's reality of it is. So you just start with how many days per week can you train? Because that's going to anchor everything. If you're just like, hey, three days a week is the max I'm going to put out there. Like, okay. And we're going to design it within those parameters. And then we're going to design, um, you know, what do you need? Do you need energy throughout the day? Are you crashing? Are you, uh, is your blood glucose all over the place? Are you high tension, high stress person or not? Are you personally recovered? Do you sleep well? Do you need to put on muscle? You, are you uh, overweight? Okay, great. Are you overweight and under muscled? We see that quite commonly. Um, do you have personal disclose? I just want to get this bigger. I want to get, you know, uh, most people at 40 stop having performance based goals, like some right. do, but most. So then what are you going after? And then we're just going to construct a program that fits your physiology. I mean, the reality of it is every time I work with an individual, they're going to run through our full, uh, what's called rapid health optimization stuff. So they're going to run through full diagnostics uh they're gonna run through full labs so they're gonna get blood hair urine stool saliva all of that's gonna be collected right because i want to know everything that goes in their body as well so they're gonna have a full dietary analysis i want everything i want to understand everything from what type of shampoo you're using where you're getting your water from all the food you're eating everything that's going in your mouth everything that comes out of your body is number two which i just described extensive blood work urine saliva stool everything 
uh, how that all makes you feel. So it's a whole bunch of very specific and tailored and scientifically validated questionnaires, plus a whole bunch of questionnaires that I've used over my life, you know, and things that I want to know. And then the fourth component of that is always how do you perform? So it's a whole bunch of functional tests on you, as well as some other stuff of metabolic flexibility and energy and things like that. Once I have a beat on all four of those areas, then you're going to get a hand constructed program based on all those needs. And that's obviously going to come with sleep programs, nutrition programs, supplementation, uh, breath work, whatever else is needed. But the training program is going to be a function of that. And the reason I'm bringing all that up is like sometimes, for example, you can combine things in a workout and you can get things like meditation, quote unquote, and um, recovery and energy production all done in the same workout as strength. Sometimes you need to separate those. And so when people talk about things like, oh, I need to do more yoga and I need to do like uh, breath work, you're like, okay, maybe love all those things. We could also probably incorporate that into your training and save you get all this done in 40 minutes Hmm. or maybe not. Maybe you actually need to do them separately depending on sort of where your stuff is at. So um, when you understand kind of the full physiological package, we can actually put together full programs that are going to hit what we call your performance anchors. So these are these most severe things that are just dragging you back and holding you down. So rather than just coming around and trying to like push on every part of the boat that we can push on, it's just like, let's find that anchor, pull that anchor up and then just get out of the way. And then just watch how fast and how least resistant you feel just moving at your physiology's own pace. If we can just find that anchor. Uh, and then, so we have a lot more success doing that, pulling that thing up and, and then just watching the body just take off. And then all of a sudden now you're getting more, out of your workouts, you're getting more results, you're getting up faster, energy is going up, focus, mental brain fog, like all the things are just getting taken care of yourself. So, I mean, that's, I know that's really, not really at what you asked, but like that one might be yeah. I mean, kind of like, Hey, what's, how would you put the protocol together? I'm like, that's, that's our system man. that's how it works. Yeah, no, there's a lot of moving parts. And, uh, you know, I know you mentioned eating, um, and I've done some, I watched some of your, your videos on, on eating for like hypertrophy and things like that. How, what type of, um, program do you typically, um, align for someone who's looking to, to build, you know, get stronger and, you know, get in hypertrophy. Yep. So you got a handful of pillars that we go after. Um, all of our diets are actually micronutrient based. So what that means is because we have the full panels and, and full analysis, you're going to get put on a uh, nutrition plan that's not only based for your calories and your macros, like how much protein, but it's also micronutrient specific. So it's very food items. So you're going to have like an apple at lunch, not an orange, like an apple, very specifically because we need to get A, B, C, D, et cetera. Um, but if you want to go to any of those videos on YouTube, you can see what I call the 90%, which is like what's 90% likely to work for 90% of people. Okay, great. Like you don't want to do all the labs, you know, whatever. You just want to get like what's most likely to work. If you want high precision, we can do that. It's right. like, you want to not miss? Okay, this will work for sure. There's no way it misses. If you just want to like start though with the free stuff, it's probably going to work 90% of the time for 90% of people, which is a big ass chunk. So mm-hmm. you're probably fine. Um, just watch that 90 for 90 video. But the, the quick kind of version is, you know, in a case like you just laid out, you want to get hypertrophy and stronger. You need to get, uh, protein's got to be there. A gram of protein per pound of body weight is a, is a pretty good starting point. Um, if you get there or even a little bit higher than things like protein timing. So, you know, when do I have it throughout the day, uh, protein quality, you know, what type of protein is better. Those questions actually don't matter that much. If you get just enough total protein, in. Right. if you're not getting enough in, then you're going to be really careful with when and what types and what forms and, and everything like that. But if you just get enough protein, you're fine. Um, from there, we want a nice variety of foods and colors. People tend to eat brown and orange a lot uh, and and the other color is not. So everyone tends to think green. That's great. Dark green is amazing, but you need orange and yellow and blue and purple and and red and pink and like as many different colors as you possibly can. So we want that. I want a consistent pattern. So eat at roughly the same time most days. And whether that's going to be three meals a day or five, I don't really care. But just try to be on a consistent plan. Consistent is the number one starting place. For nutrition if you want to make a change by far just be consistent in your routine your body will thank you um, tremendously for that in fact we know the literature there's an interesting study that came out where they they uh, matched people for macronutrients and total calories but they just had one group eat consistently 
in terms of what time of day they ate and the ones were inconsistent. And the ones that ate more consistently lost more body fat, hmm. despite the fact that calories and food items were identical, like the exact same food items, just consistent timing or not consistent timing. So that part really, really, really matters. Um, you want to make sure your fiber intake is sufficient. So something around the line of 10 grams of fiber per thousand calories you eat. So for most people, that's 25 or so grams, you know, 20 grams of fiber per day. Um, you want to have a, a, a bunch of servings of vegetables at most meals. You want to have multiple servings of fruit um, throughout the day. And then your carbohydrates uh, should be a nice mix of, of starches and um, even a little bit of faster acting uh, carbohydrates. So those are a handful of the rules. I mean, fat can fill in the gaps for whatever else you have left in your calories. So if you do that, and your calories are roughly appropriate. And you don't even need to track them, by the way. You just need to sort of track your body weight and your recovery and your sleep and everything like that. Then you should be in a really good spot. So that's like, that's a quick outline of sort of the 90%. Do you have any thoughts on the carnivore craze that's going on? I think it's super boring. <laughs> do it if you want to do it. I don't really care, but it's yeah. not interesting at all to me. Let's talk hydration because I do, I don't know, I, I do yoga from to hot yoga from time to time and everyone's like, oh, drink water, drink water. But really it comes down to more than that, right? Why don't, why don't you touch on the importance of hydration and, um, um, you know, sodium, potassium and the minerals? Sure. So there's a, a, another couple of hours of videos on YouTube if you want to get the full <laughs> explanation. Got it. There. Um <clears throat> So yeah, man, you, you mentioned it correctly. Uh, most people say things like hydration, it's important to be, uh, you want to drink around half of your body weight in ounces per day of water. All right, so what the hell is that mean? If I'm 200 pounds, half my body weight is 100. So you want to drink around 100 ounces a day. Most water bottles are like 16 ounces or something like that, mm -hmm. sometimes 20. I mean, I think the big one I got here is like 24, something like that. So yeah. Um, if I was 200 pounds and I had a 20 ounce water bottle, you're going to do five of those a day. That's, that's a rough starting point. Okay, great. Hydration though is, is only one part of that is fluid intake. The other part of it is you have to be able to maintain um, the osmo osmolarity and osmolality in the blood. What that means is, you know, if you look at how many particles are in fluid, um, the concentration is, is another way to think about this. And what happens is you want to actually have, you need to have fluid in your blood, but the vast majority of the fluid in your body, you know, 70 or so percent uh, of your body being water, but most of that is actually in your cells. And so you need to think about water being in your cells. You need to think about it being in your blood, which is plasma. And then you need to think about it as being in what's called interstitial. So it's the fluid that surrounds each cell. All right. So the trick with hydration is you need to get water from in your mouth, out of your belly, in the blood, and then into tissue. Well, if you remember basic concentrations, um, you know that you can re regulate where fluid goes based on osmolarity, right? So if you have a high concentration on one side, low concentration on the other side, it's going to go from the low to the high, right? So they're going to even these things out. Mm. Um, well, what that means is then you have to get the ability to regulate both the fluid as well as the concentrations, because the concentration the thing I'm talking about is made up mostly by electrolytes and glucose and things like that. So if you're just dumping a bunch of, of fluid in say your blood, so you drink a whole bunch of pure water and then your blood gets super dilute and you didn't really actually do anything to get that water from the blood into the cells, what ends up happening is your body registers you as being super hydrated, overhydrated, and it actually will get you to start peeing water out despite the fact that that water actually never got into the tissue, which is where you needed it to begin with. So if you were to be very, very, very dehydrated and your blood got very thick and concentrated and you just put a bunch of water back in there. So if you got an IV of just like straight water, then you would actually just pee, pee, pee clear and still be dehydrated. dehydrated. Right. Cellular. So you want to put back in exactly the concentration that you lost. And so one way that we do this is we actually measure um, what's coming out of the athletes. So we know what exactly they're sweating. And so when we formulate their hydration cocktails, it's specific to the concentration in, in their system. And that actually helps them avoid things like diarrhea. So if you actually get in way too much salt, then that salt 
will actually go to your, your digestive system and will pull fluid into it and you'll get diarrhea, right? Mm. And so now again, you're dehydrated, but now you're having diarrhea, which is just like a massive, massive right. problem, depending on how dehydrated you actually are. So you need to nail both sides of the equation here, which is fluid intake as well as electrolyte intake. And that's that's what's going to happen. Um, and when we say electrolyte, what we're generally talking about is sodium chloride, which is salt, right? Now, there are other parts to uh, hydration electrolytes. Um, magnesium is another very important one, calcium, things like that. But generally, we're talking about sodium and chloride, potassium being the other part of the equation. And the reason that's important is because we have a gradient. Uh, between sodium and potassium in and outside of the cell. And when that gradient gets changed, that's what causes muscle contraction. And so if you put in way too much, say, potassium on the outside or way too much sodium or something like that, um, you mess with that gradient and now you start getting things like cramps or you get the opposite, right? Where you just get no contraction, which is what happens when, uh, like if you were to give people a giant bag of potassium, you could put it, give them like an IV of potassium, their heart would just stop. Because there's like no contraction, they happen. There's no gradient, uh, and the reason is potassium, sodium, and, and well, any rock, any mineral, is going to have has a uh, electrical charge, and so you're trying to balance that electrical charge between inside and outside of the cell. And if those things become actually balanced, then there's no electrical exchange, then nothing happens. So you need to have a gradient between one side and the other one, so you can get electrical charge. Uh, chloride being the negatively charged charged one, that everything else is positively charged. So you got to balance where that chloride is. You got to balance where that sodium is and sodium and chloride. Um, we'll, we'll finish that off. Salt, sodium, chloride. Like I said, the sodium is positive and the chloride is negative. So you put them together, you form this wonderful little molecule called salt and it's evenly charged and it's happy like that. You put it in your system, you can split it up and now you can put some of the charge one place, some of the charge in another place. And now you have your gradient. You had a good explanation. Yeah. Cause I would say like I did a hair mineral test and um, sure. I found out that I was, you know, slightly dehydrated. And um, what type of ways do you get sodium into the diet for individuals and even yourself? Yeah. So one of the reasons we see this being a, a huge problem is people tend to, oftentimes when they want to get healthier, it's like great. They start cutting out or, or reducing or cutting out entirely processed foods. Great, awesome start. They start going to restaurants and eating out. Okay, great, awesome start. Well, the downside about that is. If you don't add salt to your food, then your sodium intake just went way, way, way down. So right. it's not crazy for people to be consuming like eight to 10 grams a day of sodium. And it's like, well, wait a minute. Now all of a sudden that drops to 1500 milligrams or 1.5, right? And it's like, holy shit. You're like, I feel terrible. Like, yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So you got to go back and add it. So <clears throat> just the easy way around this, cook all of your food yourself, prepare it, you know, as much as you can. No one's a robot. You're going to eat out a couple times a week. It's, it's not a big deal, right? Um, but most of the meals, if you're creating them at home, just salt them heavily. No, not excessive. Like just salt them to really good taste. That, that's all you have to do right. for most people. If you are, are, are living in an extremely human environment or have a very physically demanding job where you're sweating a lot and or you train really, really hard, then we may need to supplement that a little bit more. But outside of that, if you just salt your food very well, uh, and again, it shouldn't taste like super salty. You shouldn't be like, wow, God, that's salty. It's like, don't skimp on it. Be like, yeah, yum, this tastes delicious. And then if you do that, you should be fine. Let's talk recovery. Um, what I, Other than just rest, I know, and we can talk about your, I know you have a product coming out or absolute rest. We can touch on that. Um, but what type of recovery supplements do you like, or perhaps even like some type of cold or heat um, when it comes to uh, recovery and just like training. Sure. Which one do you want to start with? Yeah. So let's start. Well, I will say this. I put a cold plunge in my house <laughs> and, uh, it's like the best thing I've put in my house. Um, but I try to use it, you know, I use it thoughtfully. I'm not like going in there, you know, all the time. I try to find days where maybe I have an off day or, um, I don't do it like a few hours before bed or things like that. I'll usually do them, you know, middle of the day, but you know, if I do a strength training workout, I know that since I just broke down muscle, I don't, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't want to just jump into a cold exposure right after that. Maybe if I went for a run, but you know, uh, anytime I'm muscle building, uh, I won't go into it, uh, at least for a few hours, but, um, I guess what would you say around cold and how, how someone can implement that into their lives? 
Yep, sure. I mean, you, you pretty much nailed it there. So I would stay out of the cold after exercise. Uh, that's, if you think about it this way, the body adapts when stressed. And the whole point of exercising is to generate a stress. Right. If you then, though, immediately after, go suppress that stress signal, then you've suppressed the physiological signal to adapt. So you don't want to do that. And the research will show that really clearly. It's going to blunt or block muscle growth and gains post-exercise. So I would say completely out of it for many hours, if not half a day or more. Um, or okay. just do it before the session or do it, like you said, on, on off days. So I don't do it um, anywhere around the training programs. You're better off going hot, actually, if you want to go sauna or hot uh, jacuzzi or something like that post-exercise. Yeah. Post-exercise. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that, that's a good way to go about it. Um so yeah, you, you can use cold. Cold's great. Obviously, I've been a huge advocate of cold water immersion for many, many years now. So <laughs> I'm a big fan of it. Um, if you want to do contrast, that's fine too. You go hot, cold, hot, cold. Not a lot of research on contrast. Um, we have a lot of practical experience with it. You know, some people say it's meh. Some people like it. I don't know. Um, there's a lot of evidence on on sauna though, or sauna, or I like I like I like hot water immersion much better. So I like a hot bath or jacuzzi much more than a sauna personally but sauna is fine too um either way you're going to get really hot that's the way you want to go about it so those those are good for recovery um, those are also just generally good for basic health stuff i think it's very important for people to sweat very hard twice a week uh, whether that's from your training whether that's from your jujitsu whether that's from uh sauna work whatever i don't really care it is incredibly important though for you to 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 move things out the body in and out the body and then have that pumping um, right. There's also a whole bunch of physiology behind why it's important to turn on those heat signals. So very, very important there. Um, sauna assistant, like people love doing the sauna because you like you just sit there. And it feels good. <laughs> <laughs> like I was just going to say, uh, I've done some cold exposure pre-workout, uh, yeah. maybe like an hour before, 30 minutes before. And like, I actually find my endurance goes up during... Yeah. Because you know you're you're I'm I'm assuming your core temperature it takes it more stress for it to actually get you know higher so you can almost last longer. Well, your core temperature actually is like pretty robust against okay. change. It doesn't like to move much, um, nor should it. Like you don't want that thing to right be be going much different. Uh, but yeah, like there's 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 some stuff there. It, uh, we've played a lot in that in that in arena. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I don't have any problem with it. Of course, then you're gonna rewarm back up and get ready to do all your training, you know, and all that. Right. Um, it, it's good for recovery. Like there's, you want, you want to quickly change your like HRV score or anything, something like that. Do cold water immersion. Like you'll, you'll bounce up. You'll, your HRV will shoot way up, you know, 30, 60, 90, 180 minutes post cold water immersion. Your HRV will be super high, which is good. Um, so yeah, pre, pre in the morning is, is much, I'm much more uh, likely to do something like that. What about supplementation? Uh, I know you have uh, some favorites. What are, what are some of your maybe top three? Yeah, sure. So re recovery is an interesting thing because it's, again, it's a systematic thing. Um, the way that you want to think about it is this. So you have, a, you know, the stress bucket, as people like to say, right? And so there's this total bucket and it can only fill so much. So the way that we like to paint this picture is, okay, if you want to maximize recovery, what you're really talking about is you want adaptability. So you want to get more results from your training. Okay, then you actually have to bring in the full equation here. So the whole equation is adaptability is equal to your visible stressors combined with your hidden stressors um, taken into account then your recovery capacity. And so what's that mean is, well, do we really need to improve recovery capacity or do we just need to reduce a visible stressor or a hidden stressor? If you do that, adaptability goes up. And so people tend to just jump to recovery, but I always jump to the first. It's like, well, hold on here. Let's go back to the beginning. So how, are we sure we're optimizing your visible stressors? So visible stressors, though, that I define those is things that you are aware of and can see that are combining and adding toward that stress bucket. So these are things you tend to feel, you tend to see, and you probably, you probably know better. But they're adding to your stress bucket, which means you can think about it this way. They're reducing your recovery capacity. So you don't need to add recovery. You just need to reduce these visible stressors, uh, alcohol, bad sleep, um, mental stress, um, poor CO2 tolerance, um, 
bad diet, things like this, right? You know better. You probably feel the effects quite clearly. And if you just get those better, all of a sudden, bada bing, bada boom, recovery capacity shoots up. I don't. I didn't need to go buy a sauna, right? You just needed to actually figure your sleep out, or you needed to figure out something else. Um, the second one is called a hidden stressor. So these are things that are pause, causing same amount or more stress to the system, same exact effects, but you don't necessarily know them or feel them. So this is a vitamin B six deficiency. You know, no one wakes up and goes, "God, my B six is low today," right? Like <laughs> you can't feel that though. You feel the effects. You have a fungal infection, bacteria, something else going on inside your body, um, your immune system compromised, excessive inflammation, oxidative stress, like something like this. Uh, maybe cortisol is dysregulated. Maybe your DHEA or, or um, antigens are, are way up or down or t testosterone's out, free, total, sex hormone binding globulin is out of whack. Insulin's having a problem. You don't realize that your fasting glucose is okay, but your insulin's dysregulated. You're metabolically inflexible. There's all these things that you may or may not be feeling but they're happening, causing stress to your system. So that's that's the other place we're going. If we fix those two things, we tend to not have to do anything for recovery tricks. And people's recovery just blasts and people just like, oh my God, I don't even get sore anymore. I feel great the next day. And you're like, I didn't add any penny to recovery, you know, tricks or whatever. Right. If you have to go to that next level though, in terms of recovery tricks, you know, you mentioned the, the hot, that's a nice one. You can do something like, uh, you know, I've used the Mark Pro uh, E-STEM. It's not E-STEM, but it's similar, right? So there's like electrical pads you can put on your body and kind of twitches it. Those can be very, very, very effective. I've used those for years. Mark Pro is my favorite by far. Uh, Normatec compression boot, that's fine too. Uh, we've actually done a study in our lab on them. Um, those are our quick ones. Um, you can even do more mental stuff like, uh, you know, a five-minute meditation or a Zen session, just eyes closed. I'm a huge fan of down-regulation breath work, you know, simple tricks like that. These are all really, really good for, even though you're like, well, that's a mental thing. Well, trust me. They're all tight. If you can calm down, <laughs> physiology is going to get better. Um, so those are all tricks there. And then when it comes to food and when it comes to supplementation, it's the same thing. It's not necessarily that there's fancy recovery supplements. It's just that these are supplements that your body, that's picking up for a hole in your body. And that by default will then enhance recovery. So very, very basic, almost guaranteed ones. We talked earlier about protein has to be there. So protein should be there. I generally love putting in, um, uh, uh, making sure carbohydrates are <clears throat> around training. Timing of protein isn't as important, but timing of carbohydrate can be important. So I like to have those as well. Uh, creatine has just an absurd amount of research behind it. It's, it's highly effective for a number of things. Uh, making sure your salt and hydration is on point. Uh, I love actually Momentus makes a recovery uh, protein powder blend, basically. Mm -hmm. um, that that That's really nice. And this cocktail is sort of like your whole recovery package in one by Momentus. Momentus. So, yeah, that, that's a nice place to start if you want that one. Um, but that's really, it's honestly it. Like most of our folks are going to have something like some sort of combination of carbohydrate, protein, and um you don't necessarily have to have creatine around your workout, but as long as it's there and in, in right. your protocol someplace, then you're totally fine. But that's really all you need. And if, if someone's working out late, let's say four times a week, doing like an upper body, lower body split, um, would you say recovery time, you know, two to three days between workouts? Well, uh, it doesn't have to be. It could okay. be a day. So if you're doing like upper lower splits, so say Monday's upper lower is Tuesday, off Wednesday, Thursday upper, Friday lower, something like that. Sorry, hold on one second. One second. All right, clear my throat. <laughs> um, then you did Monday upper, and then you did Thursday upper again. That's that's plenty. If you want yeah. to skip that off day on Wednesday though, and just give yourself one day off, that's totally fine too. It just depends on the volume, how much you're doing on that Monday. Uh, it depends on how heavy you're doing. It depends on kind of like the type of training. It depends on you. You know, if your stress bucket's really full from all this other stuff, well, then you're going to have to just give yourself more time, do less volume. But the the nice part about emptying that stress bucket from things you don't want stress in there, which means you get to pour more and more stress in from the areas you want, which means way more training. So you get to train so much harder and you get the same level of that stress bucket by getting that type of stress out of there that you didn't want in there. Right. And uh, now, now you can train super, super, super hard and come back again a day and a half later or two days later. 
Yeah. Or they're the same day, like depending on what you're doing or the next day for sure. A few more and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish it up. Do you have any thoughts around uh, fasting? Sure. Many thoughts. What would you like <laughs> to talk about? Um, is this something that you do personally or that you implement with your clients from time to time? Well, fasting is a triggered word here. You're going to uh, invoke some emotion in some listeners. <laughs> it depends on what you mean by fasting, right? So we all fast, of course. The vast majority of people are going to fast somewhere like 12 hours a day anyways. So do I think there's some special magic pushing your eating window back two hours in the day? No. No, I don't. So a 14-hour fast is basically like so close to what most humans do that this is totally irrelevant. Um, if you're asking about like longer extended fast, yeah, I've done lots, plenty of 40 hour fast and things like that. And, and by fast, I mean, nothing like water, uh, no coffee, no butter, no, like, no, no calories. Like if you're having a calorie friends, you're not fasting. I don't care if that, I had a kid one time. He's like, oh, I don't even fast. This is in classes, poor soul. And I was like, oh, I don't fast. I'm gay. What type? And he was like, oh yeah, 16, eight. I'm like, okay, great. So that means you go. You, you're eating your eating windows compressed into an eight hour window and you're fasting for 16. Right. I'm like, great. He's like, yeah, so I don't eat until like one or 2 PM. And blah, blah, blah. I'm like, okay, great. What do you do in the morning? He's like, oh yeah, I have, uh, I just have black coffee with MCT oil. And I'm like, cool, 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 cool. You know, MCT oil is food, right? And he's like, no, 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 it's just oil. And, <laughs> and like, you can just see the look on his face. He's like, oh no. And like his whole world shattered. Yeah. So I'm like, if I put that whole oil and like put it into a whole nut, is that food? He's like, definitely. And I'm like, so if I just smash that all up and put it in a blender, it's no longer not. And he's just like, oh, damn it. Yeah. So if you're putting calories in, friend, you're breaking your fast. The question is, do you care? I don't know. Why are you fasting to begin with? Right. Do you think there's some sort of magic happening there? There's not. Um, if it's just like, I don't like to eat food in the morning because my stomach is nauseous. Oh, that's fine. <laughs> I don't care. Um, so do I ever go out of my way to program fasting to, to, to athletes and client and our executive clients? Not often. Um, if they prefer it that way, sure. We can work with that. Um, there's no benefit to that at all. Um, and then there's sometimes there's occasional things that pop up, um, where we need to do some things, but we'll, we'll, we will go out of our way to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but for the most part, um, I'm rarely going to it. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, Unless I really like it, it's fine. It's just not needed. Right. I mean, I find for, for some people, and including myself, sometimes it just gives you boundaries around your day, you know, sometimes because most think most people that are eating past seven, eight o'clock, there's not a lot of good things that are being eaten at that yeah, time. Yeah, sure. Yeah, fair. I mean, <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. You got to create the boundaries one way or the other. There's going to be some restriction with food one way or the other. You got to right. pick your poison. If that's the poison you like, I have no issue with it whatsoever. Um, and one last question that I asked all my guests, what, what one tip would you give someone middle-aged 45 plus individual looking to get their body back? What, what one tip would you give that individual? What I would say is precision. And what I mean by that is if this is not your full-time life, this is not your full-time passion. You're just going to get inundated constantly with podcasts and posts and things you should be doing. That's all true. It's going to get overwhelming though. So you need to find kind of like that one thing that is the most important for you. And then just be happy with that. If not, you're going to, your head's going to explode with what ifs. Right. Yeah. What if I take this special supplement for aging? What if I do this? No, if I... So Fine. keep it find simple. The, <laughs> keep it simple and find the biggest thing, the thing that moves yeah. the needle the most with you. And just make sure you get very, very good at that. And then find the next biggest thing and then do that and just work your way down. But just don't get, don't major in the minors. Hmm. That, that. That's the way I put it. Yeah. I love that. Well, Dr. Galpin, thanks for coming on. A lot of yep. great, a lot of great knowledge. And um, where's the best place for people to learn about you? Yeah, Instagram and Twitter are the most uh, active places. Um, and then, of course, all the educational stuff is up on YouTube. Okay. And then I know uh, you got uh, that AbsoluteRest.com, right? Is that something that's coming out too? Yeah. So two other things. Absolute Rest is one of my companies. <laughs> that's uh, by far the world's most 
advanced sleep diagnostics. So this is a full clinical grade sleep study done in your own house, in your own bedroom. It's in full uh, biomarkers. It is full psychological evaluation by a Harvard trained MD in sleep. Um, it is uh, full circadian training, rhythm light training by the folks who worked on the International Space Station and things like that. Some of the most published sleep scientists in the world. Uh, full environmental scan of your bedroom. So of your air quality, temperature, organic, uh, volatile organics that are coming out of your mattress or your wall and formaldehyde and mold and lead and just anything like that, that that's floating around. Mm -hmm. And then it is a whole program uh, individualized to your data based on sleep. So you can check that out. And as well as the other one is Rapid Health. Um, I think you can go to rapidhealthreport.com and then you can see a sample of kind of what I was talking about of um, us going through somebody's blood work and all the stuff you can find in there and how you can create these high precision stress sleep, um, brain, focus, sexual function, energy, libido, like all these things uh, can really, really be improved with high precision stuff. And this is without drugs. So, so no drug, no therapy, no tear, like none of that stuff. It is just getting your sleep dialed, but how to actually do that rather than just a bunch of blanket statements. It's getting mm -hmm. your nutrition dialed, but how to actually do it rather than just here's some macros and then some high precision supplementation. That's all third-party certified you know, basic stuff, but it's, it's precision that matters here. So, yeah. And that's rapid health and absolute rest. And I'll put, uh, I'll put some note, uh, put them in the show notes, put the, um, the websites in the show notes and then Andy Galpin.com. So thanks. That works. Yeah. All right, Andy. Well, I appreciate you coming on and, uh, thanks again. All right. Thanks a lot, Brian. Thanks for listening to the get lean, eat clean podcast. I understand there are millions of other podcasts out there and you've chosen to listen to mine and I appreciate that. Check out the show notes at briangrin.com for everything that was mentioned in this episode. Feel free to subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend or family member that's looking to get their body back to what it once was. Thanks again and have a great day.